Entrepreneurs Over 40, Episode 35, featuring Lakita Mondley, talking about how she overcame teen pregnancy to become a successful coach, real estate investor, and Proverbs 31 woman. Education is very important to me, but the way that a person obtains education, life has taught me that it is not a one recipe thing. Like one recipe doesn't fit every person. The way that they pursue education to do the thing that they've been called to do that they're passionate about can be very different for each person. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today wears many hats. In addition to being a devoted wife, mother of five, and grandmother of five, she also operates in purpose and expertise as a savvy real estate investor, transformational coach, teacher, trainer, and international speaker with the John Maxwell team. From the UK to Kenya, Germany, and back to the US, her mantle is to charge others with the task of progressing into the best version of themselves. She loves to equip individuals, organizations, and ministries to unlock their full potential and live out their mission in the most authentic way possible. Her passion is to partner with women as they embark on the journey of realizing their individual places of courage, destiny, and power. This partnership can come from her speaking engagements, group coaching, or individual coaching sessions. Her passion for helping women walk in purpose comes from her own personal journey. Without further ado, Lakita Monley. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I can't complain. I can't complain. It's uh, it's another beautiful day in the great state of Texas, so it's good. Good deal. Now, can you take a few moments, Lakita, and fill in the gaps from that intro and bring us up to speed with, with what's going on in your world today? Yes, yes. So, and, you know, intros and bios are always really great tools to use, but if someone wants to just ask me, tell me about yourself, I tell them something really, uh, really, really short and to the point. The things that matter most to me is the fact that I am a proud military spouse. That makes me a wife. I'm a mom of five. I'm a grandmother of five. And my husband and I are brand new empty nesters. And we're just really uh, enjoying this phase of life, spoiling our grandkids and having the opportunity to do the wonderful things in ministry that the Lord has allowed us to do. Um, right now. So that kind of really just summarized who I am really like every, all of that other great stuff as a John Maxwell speaker, coach and facilitator. Those are just the cherries on top of the cake, if you will. My life as a wife and a mother, and now in this phase of life as a grandmother, were really the the building blocks that the Lord used to and put together that allows me to be a great John Maxwell certified speaker, coach and facilitator. Okay. Now, thank you for your husband's service and your family's sacrifice. I know that was not easy. Oh, you're most welcome. It it wasn't easy. There were some very, very uh, trying times across his career. He's retired now, praise God. He retired in 2017, but we're still very, very active in our military community. And so after retirement, he took off one suit and put on a different type of suit and he's back at work doing the things that he loves, which is training and supporting his fellow soldiers so that they can then fulfill the missions that that need to be fulfilled in order to keep our great nation moving forward. Okay. Now, did either of you come from an entrepreneurial background? Did anybody in your families have their own businesses? Yes. So my husband's dad was a contractor. He built homes, every, anything to do with building a home, demolishing a home, repairing, remodeling. My father-in-law, I did all of that. So my husband spent a lot of time working with his dad and my husband's uncle owned a few automotive repair shops in the small town where we're from. So that's all he knows is entrepreneurship. And for me, my mom's dad, my paternal grandfather did the same thing. He uh, was a contractor for as long as I can remember growing up. And so, yeah, the desire to create something out of nothing, if you will, uh, to follow your passion and your dreams is something that is deeply rooted in our DNA. 
Now, how did you you and your husband meet? Were y'all high school sweethearts, or yes, we are. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yes, we are. I met him. As a matter of fact, I was a freshman and he was a senior when we first initially met. And funny thing is, on that first initial encounter, I did not like him. He annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a persistent fellow, though. <laughs> He's a persistent fellow. So here we are. We met in 1992, so that's all about 29 years ago. And the Lord has blessed us uh, with a beautiful marriage um, of 25 years. And coming up in next month, actually, uh, it's 24 years. Coming up in next month in February, we'll celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So how did your, how did your coaching journey begin? So that's... Great question. It began unintentionally, actually, <laughs> very unintentionally. I, I know for a fact that this is definitely God's purpose and plan for my life. And like I said, I met my husband in high school. So we made a bad decision on an occasion. And we became teenage parents. There was a social worker that the Lord placed in my life that at that time we had no idea what coaching was, but she coached my husband and myself and coaching my husband wasn't even a part of her job. She was a social worker that was assigned to me because I was a teenage pregnancy, but looking at our strong family backgrounds and everything, she said to us one day that failure is not an option for you guys. You made a mistake. Now I'm just going to help and guide you in making sure that though things will be a little tough. Now you can still accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish it's just going to be a little bit more difficult, but I'm partnered with you. And she did just that. She partnered with us um, from that moment. And for the next six years, she would continue to reach out to us and check on us and see our progress. And so at that moment, I decided, OK, I want to do something in my life where I'm helping other people just like that. And so I went to university to become a social worker. But then in my uh, sophomore year, I realized, OK, I don't want to do it like this. There's too many restrictions, too many restrictions to me that does not actually allow them as social workers to be the biggest help that they want to be in their heart. So I went to looking for other things. And then about that time in my life, I was about 25 and my husband and I made the decision to take my walk with Christ a lot more seriously. And so I began to ask the question, you know, Lord, what is my purpose? What am I called to do? And he showed me very clearly it's to help other women and inspire and motivate other women who are maybe walking through some of the challenges that you've walked through or will walk through. And so I began to do that from a ministry perspective at church. And that kind of just blossomed into me being a John Maxwell speaker, coach and facilitator uh, years later after having actively done that type of coaching through the various different ministries that we've been blessed to be a part of here within the States and as well as in Germany. And while in those places, we were able to be connected with some ministries there within Kenya. And it's, it's just been a blessing. It wasn't, like I said, it wasn't intentional. It's kind of an accident, a life choice. The Lord used okay. a life choice to help put me on the path to do what he, he had called me to do. The reason that I was born, this is the thing that I was born to do. And he let that one, what seemed like a horrible decision. And he actually used it as the word says and worked it out for my good. He often does that. He does. He does. Oftentimes you can't imagine how something could be used for his purposes. And then years later you look back and, oh, that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. We talk about it from time to time. We like to share our story often. and. When I found out that I was pregnant and there was a big family meeting, right? After church on Sunday, oh, sorry. his family comes <laughs> over and we're at my grandmother's house and the two families are there talking. It's like, okay, what are we going to do? None of that conversation on that day, everyone in that room could not have imagined the journey that the Lord had in store for these two young people who had made a bad decision. And so now as families, what are we going to do? How are we going to support them 
through this, what things need to be done to support them through this. No one in the, in that room at that time could have imagined, including myself and my husband, could not have imagined how the Lord was causing that decision to work out for our good. Now, do you still keep in touch with that the social worker that initially inspired you? I, I do. We had lost contact for a number of years. And as it would happen, my uncle is an assistant pastor. He took over assistant pastor position at a church that's about 30 miles away from my hometown. And so we were home. I was home visiting, went to church with him on this particular Sunday. It was his Sunday to preach and the family came out to support. And after service and we were fellowshipping with country people, I'm from Mississippi. There's no such thing as a church service without a good meal after the fact. So we're fellowshipping and I'm eating some of the best chicken and pie that I've had in a long time. And I look up and there she is like, oh my God, I hadn't seen her in probably 20 years at that time. And here she is walking back into my life. And so, yes, at this point in my life, had you asked me that maybe three years ago, the answer would have been, no, I haven't talked to her in a long time. But today asking me that, yes, we are in contact and she is such a blessing. Well, that's got to be gratifying to her to to see the changes that you have made and that you're helping other people and passing it forward. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. That is something that we do talk about um, when we do get to speak in person because I, I travel back to Mississippi often to spend time with family. And of course, I'm going to church with my uncle so that I can see her. And that's the conversation that we have. It's like the seeds that we sow into people's lives, we have no idea how important those seeds are, but we need to do it. We need to be in a position where our biggest desire is to add value to people. Now, you seem to have had a lot of financial education with regard to rich dad and finance. How did you get into that? What kind of prompted you there? So debt prompted me. Here we are, young parents. Marriage was still fairly young in 2000. And we were stationed, my husband was stationed at, in Fort Lewis, Washington, up in Washington State. And we had a lot of month and not a lot of money. That was always a topic of conversation. What can we do to earn more money? Very familiar with this bit, concept. Yeah. And we're a bit more traditional. My role as a stay-at-home mom was one that we both took, you know, really seriously. My husband's mom was a stay-at-home mom. My mom is was a stay-at-home mom for as long as we can remember. As we got older, of course, we saw our mothers go out of the house to work, but that more traditional sense is something that we are very passionate about. So what can we do to earn more money without giving up our family values that we hold important? And this infomercial used to come on all the time, talking about you do real estate with no money and no credit. You just need to learn how. And it was not a Robert Kiyosaki course. It was another course. And we eventually were able to save up enough money and buy that course. And that started our journey into real estate. And the more that we uh, learned about real estate, of course, um, learning who Robert Kiyosaki was inevitable. And we... um, began to just consume more of his books and teachings, playing his cash flow game, and then eventually taking a course with with his company and learning how to be uh, real estate investors based off of his principles, and which is how we found out about the finance course. Because there's a big difference between flipping a house here and there, getting a rental property here and there as a hobby versus becoming a full-time real estate investor as your business. And so Starting your business the right way and understanding how to start a business as a real estate investor was was necessary. It's like a continual education piece that we have to do. Okay. Now, education I'm picking up is very, very important with you. Is that a fair statement? It is a very fair statement. It is a very fair statement. I, I will say it with this. Education is very important to me, but the way that a person obtains education Life has taught me that it is not a one recipe thing. Like every one recipe doesn't fit every person. Right. Each person, um, the way that they pursue education to do the thing that they've been called to do that they're passionate about can be very different for each person. 
And that, again, was a lesson that we learned the hard way. But as we grew up, you go to work, you know, you go to high school, you go to college, or you go to high school, you go to the military, you do something, you, but you're going to do one of those things in order to set yourself up for success. My husband, because of our decision, we both had chosen college, but because we became teenage parents so quickly, he had to go to the second choice and he chose, okay, I'm going to go active duty and we'll pursue our college education while I'm on active duty because we're parents. We're parents and we have to raise a kid and we have to provide for this kid and give him the best life possible. So when our oldest son was ready to go to college, we were just in that one frame of mind. And we were very unwilling to think outside of that box. And my oldest son is a creative. I mean, he loves everything to do with the music and arts in it and many different mediums. And so going to a traditional school was not what he wanted to do. And my husband and I were not trying to hear that. And so we almost crushed his spirit because we forced him to go to a traditional school, which at that point he just said, okay, I'm just, I'm going to pacify mom and dad, but then I'm going to change and I'm going to go to the musical art institute that I want to go to, which is what he did. And we later on figured out that, hey, it's not bad. It's actually a good thing. And it's what he needed to thrive and blossom. So, and he needs to grow in that and pursue that education for that. And that's what he did. Our generation, though, it really wasn't an option so much. And I think parents were supposed to crush their kids' dreams. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> I can. I think I can agree. And and I'll do likewise. Sorry, mom. But she's going to hear this and say, "Why did you say that?" <laughs> so, what led you to pursue getting certified with both Ken Blanchard and John Maxwell? Like we said in, in our pre-conversation, my husband and I were introduced to John Maxwell as we grew as leaders in ministry Mm -hmm. and our Bishop loves all things, John Maxwell, right? I mean, he is known for leadership. He is also uh, well known as a pastor. And so we use a lot of his materials in our leadership training. And so anyway, the more that we grew and pursued different things, it's like, okay, this is the logical next step. And so when I felt like, okay, the Lord is saying, these are some the, your gifts and talents where you can use them outside of the four walls of the church. But just I knew that I had to pursue education in this area in order for me to be uh, the speaker, coach and trainer that I wanted to be outside of the four walls of the church. I needed to pursue education or certification to show that I'm qualified to do what it is that I say I'm qualified to do. For me, John Maxwell was just a no-brainer. Going through his course allowed me the opportunity to see how to strategically use the biblical principles that I've been using for years to help people and transform that into a way that can be used strategically to help organizations as well as individuals. And again, especially because my target audience, not that I don't coach or speak or do things like that for men, but my target audience is women. And as women, whether it's I'm working with a woman owned business, uh, one of my one of my current clients locally is is a female owned real estate brokerage. And I'm able to help her team with sales training and communication training and be able to use my biblical principles in a non offensive manner, if that makes sense, because I am a believer, but I also know that I'm equipped to help any individual or any company if we were partnered together, whether or not that company or individual is a Christian. So going through John's course really equipped me to be able to be the best version of myself for my clients' needs. Now, with Kim Blanchard, his courses and material, I was introduced to those through LinkedIn Learning, actually. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, through LinkedIn yeah. Learning, Ken's courses, and especially his courses on servant leadership, they're amazing. I really believe that we have to make investments into our personal development as well as our professional development. And whether that's taking a course, partnering with a coach, listening to great podcasts like your podcast, and reading books. Oftentimes, mm-hmm. we won't be able to 
meet the individuals that we follow in person, but we can definitely partner with them through reading the materials that they've written or listening to any podcast or YouTube videos that they put out. Yeah. So you've said that those who shift their minds, transform their lives and lead others into greatness. How can someone change their mindset? That's, that's awesome. So it's a process. It's not something that happens instantaneously. It's a process. We have to want to change our minds. It's like, a use for an example, right now, you know, I'm learning to eat clean. <laughs> and it's a journey for me. I had to first recognize the fact that my daily habits and what I'm e- eating, drinking, and not exercising enough was not good for this body that God gave me. We only get one. Mm-hmm. I had to change the way that I think about it. And so now, Instead of just eating for the pleasure or the taste, I'm learning to eat the right fuel that I need to make my body operate as its maximum capacity. Have I always known that eating clean was a good thing? Yeah. But did I always care? No. So mindset, I had to shift the way that I thought about that. And when I began to think differently, then that caused me to put things in place so that I could behave differently. And now I'm working on those two things together to develop into a new lifestyle. That works for everything, not just eating the right foods. It comes, it works with shifting my associations as well. When I want to think differently, I have to position myself around people who are already thinking, being, and doing the way that I want to become. So it's a process. And before you know it, you'll see that you've changed your perception, you've changed your mindset, and you'll be able to see that in your responses to different situations. You'll know my thinking has definitely changed because my life has begun to change. Somebody has to want to change first and then from there go in and associate with other people that can help them. And research and, and do the work. And do the work. Absolutely. You've got to want to change it and you've got to want to be willing to do the work. And you have to know that it's not a microwave. It's not instant. It won't happen. You know, you say, Laquita, well, I've been doing this for three days and I didn't see anything different. Well, I mean, it's only been three days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we celebrate those three days because last week you didn't even do it for three days. So let's celebrate this three days of success and let's shoot for the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, you know, so on and so forth. But as you want it, that shift will happen. It will happen. It will definitely happen. You just have to want it and be patient and be intentional, very intentional about it. So what do you think about fear and how it impacts us with regards to success? So I put fear in that category of what you just said that just acts. It's all in the way that we think about it, all in the way that we think about it. If we're looking at fear, one of the definitions that people like to use is false evidence appearing real. Yeah, that could be a thing. We can also look at fear as a fuel or a tool in our fight or flight response. Instead of fleeing, let's stand and fight. If this is something that is bringing me a great amount of of stress or apprehension. That means I need to overcome it. And the only way that I can overcome it is to confront it. And whatever that is that you're dealing with, right? So a lot a lot of times the my clients, their fear is they're either dealing with imposter syndrome or they just don't know who they are. And they're fearful of making a mistake in their pursuit of trying to find out who they are. And I encourage them to just drive head on. There's, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. A mistake is not final. It's not fatal. It, that one mistake that you make is not the determining factor to end the rest of your life. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's a building block. It's a resource that you can use when you get up, dust it off. When you're little, your mom said, dust, get up, baby, dust it off and try it again. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get up. We're going to dust ourselves off. 
We're going to take that lesson that we just learned and we're going to try it again. You think that as we got older, it'd be easier to get up and dust ourselves off. And sometimes I think it's just the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have a lifetime of ingrained fears in us. We have a lifetime of restrictions that have been bred into us. My granddaughter, she's a year old and has absolutely no fear. (laughs) She is fearless. And it's amazing to watch her try new things. And, you know, granted, she's one. So a lot of the stuff that she wants to try isn't the safest (laughs) Mm -hmm. for her. But she keeps trying it. And she'll get up and dust it off. I'll take her little chubby hands and dust it off. And, uh uh-oh, and she'll try it again. As adults, because we've had so many of those uh uh-oh moments, subconsciously, we are walking around trying to prevent the uh uh-oh moments. So much so that we oftentimes don't try the very thing that the Lord has said, when you do this, your next level of success, your next level of greatness, your next level of opportunity will begin to happen. Yeah. I, I know that fear is a tool of the devil and that he uses it. And he's that little small voice that we hear. You're not good enough, Greg. They're not going to like you. You have no right to be podcasting. And you know, believe me, I, I hear those voices. How do you view the law of attraction with regard to Christianity? I believe that the law of attraction is like many other things. The The enemy can mimic everything but love as it relates to the things of God. He cannot mimic love. And so the law of attraction is another one of those things. So many, I can think about so many verses uh, of scripture that Christians are taught, we're commanded to speak those things that are not as though they were to speak things into existence. If there are things that are going on in our life that we don't want it, we can cast it out. Speak to the mountain and shall be moved and cast into the sea. The key is we don't doubt, right? And also, as as I said, we, we are taught throughout the scripture to speak those things that are not as though they were, and we can see them manifest in our life. So I believe that as a believer, my I simply, I live by Joshua 1, 8, 7 through 9, In Psalms 1, verse 1 through 3, I believe that it's through my obedience to God's word and because of the things that he's already predestined for my life, his promises are mine, they are yea and amen in my life, that the Lord is going to provide everything that I have need of. He's going to provide the right people in my life that I need to be connected to. He's going to provide the right type of resources that I need in order to fulfill his will on the earth. So. I don't ne- I don't necessarily say the law of attraction, as it were, because a large majority of my clients are believers. We do talk about the necessity of living out biblical principles so that the things that we believe in our heart, as the scripture have said, we can have them in this natural life. Okay. That makes better sense than some of the explanations that I've had. Yeah. So if we look at Joshua 1, seven through nine, we're given a commandment to be bold and very courageous. The first commandment we're given. The world is all about living bold and just be you, right? So the Lord tells us be bold and very courageous. The second thing he tells Joshua, he says, you know, do not let the book of this law depart from your mouth, but you're to meditate in it day and night. Like when I'm, I'm bold and very courageous in the Lord, I'm meditating on his word. The other part of that is when we are meditating on his word, we observe to do all that is written therein. Big way to say, I obey. I'm studying it. I believe it. I'm obeying it. And when I obey, he said, then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. He didn't say the Lord was going to sprinkle manna from heaven. He told Joshua, study this word. Obey this word. And your obedience, you'll have good success. Same thing with um, Psalms. He's very specific in Psalms because the law of attraction is all about attracting those things to you that you need and positioning yourself around the right people, right? Psalm says, don't take counsel from the ungodly. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful, but make your delight in the law of the Lord 
And in his law, you meditate day and night. Then you should be like the tree that is planted by the rivers of living water. Your leaves won't wither and whatsoever you do shall prosper. So I am picking the right associations, right? I'm studying his word day and night. I'm obeying his word. A tree that's planted by the river is going to bear fruit all the time because it's getting everything that it needs from the soil and the water. If I am planted in that word, I'm getting everything that I need and I'm going to bear fruit. I am going to keep reproducing more trees just like me. And people will be able to eat that fruit that I give them and they'll be able to grow and prosper. So if we obey, if we study the word and we obey, we can speak those things that are not as though they were. And it's going to happen because of my faith and my obedience to God's word. It may not happen in the time that we want, but it will happen. Exactly. It will happen. It will happen. The other key to that is we will know what to ask. You know, the, the scriptures it tells us, you know, the Lord will give us the desires of our heart when we ask him. But one of the pieces that we have to remember is what we desire has to align up with God's will for our life. And we'll understand that when we're studying his word, when we're in right associations with the right people that he's divinely connected us to. We'll have that clearer understanding. Now, you had touched on this before in our pre-call. Can you define what a Proverbs 31 woman is and what that means to you? So the Proverbs 31 woman to me is the poster child for entrepreneur. <laughs> she is the poster child for entrepreneur. This model of woman is used a lot in Christian, if I can say that like that. But I believe as men and as women, we use that uh, Proverb 31 woman, but we don't really fully grasp who she is. You're saying that when sometimes people say it, they're thinking, that's ah, the meek woman, little woman that stays home. She cooks, she may clean, and that's all she does. She cooks, she cleans, she takes care of the children. That is not what this sister does at all. <laughs> I mean, she does those things but so much more. Yeah. The army used to have one of their mottos was they do more by 9 a.m. than most people do all day. That's the proverb 31 woman. And the thing is, because she is partnered with the man that God has designed for her, that whole thing about Christians being chauvinistic, this right here proves that a lie. It proves it an absolute lie because he is, very supportive of her entrepreneurial endeavors, so much so that he's getting the praises in the city gates and he loving it. Like, yes, that's my wife. She did that. She bought that field. She chose that flax. She did that. Oh, my servants, they love her. They love her because she's doing wonderful things. My children love her. That's my wife. That's what he's doing. He's not somewhere telling her to get somewhere and sit down and shut up. And you just, I'm going to go out and earn all the money. You just sit here and do what I tell you to do. And you take care of these kids. That is not what's happening here at all. She is the definition of an entrepreneur. I'm reading this out of the NIV. Listen, my son, listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to our, my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women or your vigor on to ruin kings. So the king is talking to his son. Hey, listen, let me tell you, let me explain to you the type of woman that you need in your life. And that'll help you weed out the ones that you don't need, right? The wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing. He lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing food from afar. She gets up while it is still night and provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She's got servants. That's key. She's not poor. They're well off. She provides uh, and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and she buys it. She's a real estate investor. He didn't consider the field. 
If I'm going to just go by what this say, he's still asleep. <laughs> he's still asleep or he's at the city gates. He's doing whatever it is that he's doing. And because he has full trust in her, he has access. She has access to the finances. It's not his money, her money, and he just gives her an allowance or her money is only the money that she's earned. It's none of that. They are working together as a team in unity. And she has access to the money that she needs. She sees the field and she buys it out of her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She sees the field, says, this is going to be my next vineyard. I'm planting the vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. She sees that her trading is profitable. And her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms up to the poor and extends her hand to the needy. So she's doing volunteer work. She's a, a female entrepreneur. She's buying fields. She created a business. She's growing a vineyard. And she has time for the needy. I mean, this woman is the consummate woman. And we have to understand just how valuable she is, not just to her husband, but to her servants, to her community. She's providing jobs because if she turned that field into a vineyard, now she's a local employer. It starts off by saying he trusts in her. He has full confidence in her. And she's doing all of these wonderful things and blessing her whole house and her community. She's providing jobs to her community from her resources that are coming in, from her financial resources that are coming in. She's taking from that and she's going out and she's feeding the need. I mean, she's, you know, volunteer work with the needy is what this is, what the scripture is telling us, right? She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the staff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms up to the poor and extends her hand to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. So ladies, just think about that in today's terminology, the best designer where you could find. She got chimichu from head to toe. You name it, she has it on. Like the, the best designers, right? She has it on. So they're not poor. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. And I won't go through it all. I'll stop right there at about verse 23. And so for those that are, you know, are listening and you may not have heard of Proverbs 31, Proverbs chapter 31, read the entirety of it. And you can read it in the King James, the New King James, the Amplified, the NIV. Doesn't really matter which version you read it in, but take the time and think that through very thoroughly. When you are a woman and you said, I want to be the Proverb 31 woman, you're saying you want to be a lot. Yeah, and somehow we've allowed that message to get watered down and diluted as being chauvinistic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like she is amazing. If you're a man and you're saying, I want my wife to be the Proverb 31 woman. But if you both you as the wife, as the woman and the man, and y'all have the wrong idea of what the Proverb 31 woman is, that could create a problem. So you need to find out who she really is. And she is great to aspire to be that. Amen. So switching gears just a little bit. You've got your own motivational podcast and blog called Lakita's Toolbox. What prompted you to start that? 
I do. I do. So I wanted to be able to give value to people. For about two years, I co-hosted a live on Facebook called Create Your Future Self Live with an amazing gentleman. His name is Victor Vinico Johnson. And we were all about giving value to entrepreneurs with a specific emphasis on real estate investors because he and his wife are real estate investors as well as me and my husband. As our businesses grew and prosper and schedules just got hectic, we cut it down from every Monday to once a month to eventually we had to just you know not be able to do it because of our schedules. And I wanted Laquita's toolbox because that show provided so much value to people. And we had so many amazing uh, testimonies where people, aspiring entrepreneurs and current entrepreneurs were being able to take those tools and grow their businesses and step out on faith and eradicate fear in their life and, and push forward. And that's what I really want to do. Throughout my life, the Lord has always positioned people around us to provide us tools so that we can get to our expected end. And that's really what I want to do. I want to be able to provide tools to individuals to help them get to their expected end. And I hope and pray that Laquita's toolbox is one of those ways that I'm able to provide tools to people to help them achieve the greatness that they want to achieve. I can testify that Laquita's toolbox has some great guests on and some good lessons. So, you know, definitely check it out. Now, you've got a course coming up with John Maxwell. I believe it's Everyone Communicates, but Few Connect. Thank you. Thank you. I do. Yes. So coming up, starting on Thursday, February the 24th at 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time, Standard Time, I will be hosting uh, a mastermind group, and it's based off of John Maxwell's book, Everyone Communicates and Few Connect. During this mastermind group study, We'll learn and practice how to connect authentically and, and discover and unlock the five connecting principles that John gives us in his book, Everyone Communicates and Few Connect. And as we're unlocking those five connecting principles, it leads us to a greater level of understanding how to best use these techniques to cultivate relationships and to develop great leaders. Because communicating is one thing connecting with someone is something completely different. So through these tools, we're going to learn proper communication tools, as well as ways to connect with the person that you're speaking to, whether it's your ideal client, your spouse, your business partner. It, it, communicating, connecting can be used in every area of our life. So if people are interested they can go out to my social media and I will I have links out there and I can also provide you a link as well where they can just click on that link and register to be a part of the of the mastermind. And those that want to be a part of the mastermind group, there is a ninety uh, $95 fee to be a part of the group. And in that, we will go through this six week study together, as well as I provide you with a personal development plan and two coaching calls, two 30 minute coaching calls to help in, in the areas that you feel like that you need to, to have help. And we'll develop that personal development plan together as we work through these six weeks of study. Okay. Yeah. That'd be an incredible deal. And who doesn't need to better communicate? There's times when I say one thing and my wife or somebody else will hear something completely different. Completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And it will unpack a lot because your communication style has a, a lot to do with um, your personality type as well. And so the goal there across those six weeks is to identify each student's personality type. And based on your personality type, also just give you little tools and tips on how to communicate effectively with the other personality types and, and foster that connection, understanding how to properly communicate with others fosters that connection. I and mean, we want that connection because when we feel connected, that builds the know, like, and trust factor. And you want people to know you. You want them to like you. You want them to trust you, especially as entrepreneurs and as business owners. We want to build that type of um, relationship with our clients and with our potential customers. Okay. We're coming close up to an hour so I feel like I probably need to be respectful of your time and get ready to wrap this up. Is there anything I haven't asked about that you'd like to talk about or add? 
No, actually, this has been an amazing interview. We've, we've talked about a number of different things, all great topics. I believe that by the time your listener listens to this episode, they'll have a better understanding of who I am, and what I do. But most importantly, I hope and pray that they're able to leave the episode with a tool that can help them personally as well as professionally. Okay. What's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? Know who you are. Know who you are. When we know who we are and whose we are, we won't be deceived by fake. Like you won't be deceived by that. Like the raven likes the shiny things. You won't be deceived by that. When you know who you are and whose you are, you understand purpose and you are able to pursue purpose with a passion and phony things, distractions from the enemy won't hinder you. You'll recognize them and move right past them. So know who you are and whose you are that allows you to understand your purpose and you're able to pursue your purpose with a passion. Now, what's the best way for people to check you out and get in touch with you, Lakita? The best way for people to check me out and get in touch with me, either on my website as well as on my social media. If they, if you Google Laquita Mondley, L-A-Q-U-I-T-A, last name Mondley, M-O-N-L-E-Y, all things Laquita Mondley will pop up. Feel free to go out to my website, fill out the contact us form, and I will uh, contact you back as soon as possible. If you're on any of my social media platforms, if you private message me, I am the one that's responding to those private messages. I will respond to you as well. So I, either way, they can reach out to me through my website as well as on social media. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you, Laquita, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. This has been a great experience. If you'd like to leave feedback on this episode or suggest a guest, you can reach me at eo40show at gmail.com. That's eo40show at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss it or any other episodes. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.